Our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Jackson from the London School of Economics, um, and he's talking about the, the, the fundamental question of compliance, particularly with the lockdown restrictions, I think. Over to you, John. I think you're um, on mute, John. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, too many, too many screens going on. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Um, I hope you didn't like me stay up until 5 a.m. watching the presidential election. Um, so we timed this, this webinar just a day before the second lockdown. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, and during the first, well, during, during the dark winter months that we've got ahead of us, um, I suspect some of us might be tempted to look back at the first lockdown, despite all the suffering and feel nostalgic um, for people's positive collect collective reactions. Um, the law was clear, people were on board, compliance was high it's, and, and people helped each other. Um, and this presentation touches on why. Now, fast forward to the latest part of the Corona coaster um, and the next couple of months, the second lockdown may be very different. And I'll, I'll end up with discussing how, how our findings may translate um, to the second lockdown. Okay, so Chris talked about the timeline. So um, if we cast our mind back to the end of end of March, we all remember the mantra, uh, stay at home, save lives, protect the NHS. The powers that were um, that Parliament passed on the 26th of March were extraordinary. Um, and it seemed to surprise everybody that um, most people complied. Um, and the police were able to adopt a successful enforcement as last resort policy. I've got some um, COVID mobility data here from, from um, Apple and from Google. Um, you can see, well, if you can see, see such a small graphic, you can see a, a real drop in movements um, around about um, from March 23rd onwards, uh, and then a kind of steady, gentle increase. Um, particularly, you can see that with the a Apple COVID mobility graph on the left. Um, and so how did this happen? Um, how did um, people, why did people um, comply? Um, why was uh, collective public behaviour, individual behaviour, um, why did it change um, so, so rapidly? Was it compliance by consent or compliance by compulsion? Was it collective sol solidarity or fear of COVID? What about the law? Um, did pan pandemic legislation make a difference? So we were interested in um, not only estimating levels of um, self-reported compliance and non-compliance over time, but also modeling the predictors of it. Um, in particular, we're interested in trying to understand the motivations. Um, and we often in um, psychology and law and criminology distinguish between instrumental motivations and normative motivations. So we were interested in understanding whether fear of catching COVID, fear of getting caught by the police, some instrumental motivations, whether these were important, some normative motivations, i.e. you do it because you think it's the right thing to do. We wanted to tease out whether social norms, legitimacy of the legal authorities, expressive function of the law, I'll come on to that in, in a second, whether these are important. So we wanted to understand which motivations were most important and also um, whether the motivations changed um, over time. I'll talk a little bit in a, about how we measured non-compliance, um, but essentially by the, by the time it got to wave three, um, self-reported behaviours were a lot lower, partly because the law had changed by that point. So I'm going to be focusing on um, the first three waves. Um, so this captures when, when lock, just after, a month after lockdown happened um, until everything was eased. Now, how did we measure compliance? Um, so we asked, how often during the past week have you engaged in each of the following behaviours? Um, to have you never, rarely, sometimes, often or very often socialised in person with friends or relatives whom you don't live with, go out for a walk, run or cycle and spend more than a few few minutes sitting somewhere to relax um, and travelled for leisure. And we created a mock count. We Essentially, we added up people's responses to these three questions and the these three histograms show you the, the distribution of, of this mock count over time with um, many people right at, right at the start um, not doing any of these behaviours, or at least reporting not doing any of these behaviours. And then the, over here, we're, we're into June, um, and it's a more even spread distribution. And the, these, these, these distributions over time map onto the, the mobility data, um, where you can see, for instance, in the bottom left, the um, Apple C 
COVID mobility data, you can see that people are becoming more mobile, getting out and about um, as, as it hits June, July, et cetera. So we're interested in modeling non-compliance or self-reported um, non-compliance. Um, so just to say that because it's panel analysis, panel data, um, we had two choices um, and we did both of these. So we're interested in um, estimating predictors at each wave separately. So what predicts, what are the, what are the factors predicting self-reported compliance or non-compliance non at wave one and then wave two separately and wave three. And then we do some panel analysis some cross legged cross lagged modeling to predict change over time within, in, within individuals. And here's a set of our, our potential predictors. So we've got concern about catching COVID, knowledge about COVID, expectation about the length of the pandemic, deterrence, perceptions of the chance of getting caught, legal legitimacy, police legitimacy, social norms regarding social distancing, expressive function of the law, etc. And this is, this is a, a, a description or a summary of the findings from the first bit of our analysis. Um, so I've put in put in the um, parameter estimates. So th these are the regression coefficients. And knowledge about um, COVID was a significant negative predictor of non-compliance, which means a significant predictor of compliance um, from wave one to wave two to wave three. Concern about catching COVID only became um, a factor in wave three. It wasn't a factor in wave one and two, according to the model. Um, Police legitimacy came in at wave three, and we'll come back to that later. The most consistent predictors were social norms and expressive function of the law. So I think it's useful because these, are, these, these two concepts are central to, to this um, study. I think it's useful to just summarize how these were, were measured. So people are asked, uh, do you agree or disagree? Everyone should strictly follow social distancing to help um, prevent the spread of COVID. Most people in my local community think it's the right thing to do to strictly follow social distancing. Um, how important is it to the National Health Service? Everybody sticks to the guidelines and social distancing. We kind of approach social norms in an eclectic, eclectic way. Eclectic way. Um, it's a mixture of in-group norms, prescriptive, proscriptive norms, social norms. Now, the, the expressive function of the law was, was, um, was a new concept, um, a new thing that we, we've been trying to study. Um, these are the questions that we use to, to, to tap into it. So first and foremost, do you think it's right or wrong that social distancing is a, is a legal requirement? Um, secondly, by making a, it a legal requirement, the, the government sent the message that social distancing is important to fight the pand pandemic and making social distancing a legal requirement helped to clarify what we should and should not be doing. So this is essentially the idea that when you pass a law, it sends a message. It tells people that um, something is important and it clarifies what they should be doing. Um, here, what they should be doing collectively to, to fight a national um, threat. So those are the results from our analysis of individual waves. Um, this is, this is a, a brief summary of our analysis of the panel data. So this is slightly different because what we're doing is we're modeling um, changing in compliance or non-compliance over time. And um, earlier we saw that um, by wave three levels of non-compliance, um, were lower. Actually, by that point, they weren't strictly speaking non-compliance because they weren't legal, um, illegal. Um, anyway, so what we're doing is we're modeling whether people have the extent to which they've got less compliant over time. So it's a slightly different um, level of analysis. Now, we found um, consistently that the expressive function of the law was important. Um, we found, found uh, um, consistently that concern about catching COVID um, was important and we found that social norms um, continue to be important in particular social norms kind of came into play um, in a special way by wave three in that people who agreed who had internalized these social norms also tended to keep on doing these behaviors even though they weren't uh, illegal anymore so it's a, a little summary of, of um, what, what we found. So levels of self-reported compliance were very high at wave one, decreased only slightly by wave two, um, and levels of, of compliance were um, a fair bit lower at wave three. Concern about catching COVID was a factor, as was knowledge about COVID. Um, legitimacy came in in wave three when, when the rules were less strict. Throughout, deterrence was not a factor. Um, we asked people whether they thought it was likely uh, if they were to, to break lockdown or break social distancing requirements, the police would intervene, um, and that was consistently not an issue. So 
theoretically most interesting, I think, from, from our perspective is that social norms and expressive function of the law, um, two key normative motivations, were perhaps the, the, the main factors. Um, so what are social norms? Um, I'm starting to think about whether how the, these findings would translate to, to the second lockdown. So people, we think that people look to the behavior of others to determine what was normal, beneficial and accepted. Um, people benefited from acting in certain ways through social approval. So they felt better when they um, acted in ways that people approved of. And they were refrained from acting in ways that they, they thought people would disapprove of. Um, and there's a way in which, there's a sense in which how we measured social norms, we're capturing a kind of in-group moral norm um, and the kind of identity issues here. So we think that um, social norms in this particular moment in, in history helped to define who people were um, in, the face, in the face of this threat, this global pandemic, um, people were rallying around um, uh, where norms were making each other accountable um, to each other, um, but helping to, to kind of coalesce this identity that this is the right thing to do. We need to, to save, save lives, protect the NHS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, expressive function of the law, in terms of criminology, we think this is most interesting because um, legitimacy came into play towards the end, but really the, the, it did, does seem like the, the reason why the law made the difference um, is through uh, its coordination function and expressive quality. Um, so it, our data are consistent with the idea that the law, which was a pop, very popular law amongst our participants, sent a powerful message um, about what needs to be done and why. It, it framed by everybody having to, to abide by this, it framed um, the, the, the threat at a national level. And it framed the, the idea that we can only get through this through group rather than individual actions. Um, so it's essentially it clarified what the what the um, the threat was at a national level, and it clarified how people need to collectively act um, to fight the pandemic. So put together um, the findings around social norms and expressive function, um, we think that informal rule, rules um, governing behaviour helped to bind people together. But this was sub somehow underpinned by formal rules. Um, so acting in unison, we think, helped to bind people together. Um, and because there was this legal requirement to coordinate at the group, right, group level against the common threat, um, because of that, then there was a particularly powerful kind of set of motivations that drove um, compliance. So what about now? I got some fancy graphics that I, I um, spent the weekend looking, looking at. Um, at the top, we've got data from five countries up to 27th of October, um, and this is seeing uh, cases rising. On the bottom uh, top right, we've got um, the latest findings from the REACT study. Um, levels of, of infections are going up, um, confirmed cases are going up. Um, we've got, I've got the mobility data down there. Um, you know, we can see over the summer that people were, we were more and more mobile um, in London and across the, across the UK. Um, so, you know, what, what people were doing over the summer seems to have made a difference. So how does this, how does all this translate to now? Um, well, obviously we can only speculate because our study is finished. Um, there, is, there is ongoing work, um, particularly think about the UCL COVID-19 um, social study. Um, one thing that they, they find is through their panel analysis with a, an enormous data set, enormous sample, um, that trust in government has not only gone down, um, it's also continued to be a factor in um, self-reported compliance. Um, so just by way of, of speculation, um, so it seems to me that um, as we move into the second lockdown, performative behaviors based on a simple message, you know, wearing a mask in certain spaces um, may continue to be widespread, particularly because there's strong social norms about these in, in various places. Um, now the laws and, and, and the, the rules in the law are less clear. So. I, I stole this quote from um, a tweet from Adam Wagner. So he, he, in his view, having looked at all, all of the exceptions, the ambiguous exceptions, this is the lockdown without much enthusiasm. You must stay at home, but here, here are a hundred reasons you may not have to. Um, so already mentioned that trust in government is lower. I imagine that will continue to be important. Um, compliance with track, trace and isolate um, is, is, is a big issue and I think will become an even bigger issue 
if levels of, of compliance with, with calls to isolate are so low, that's going to be a major problem. So studying why, um, what, 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 what the levels of compliance with, with track, trace and, and isolate and, and why will be an important thing. But in terms of, of, of translating our specific findings, so it seems to me that social norms will continue to play a role. Um, legitimacy may, may be an issue. Um, recall that it started to become important in week three um, when, when the lockdown was, was eased and rules were more, more fluid. I suspect that the expressive function of the law thing came in and just dominated all the other criminological explanations. So legitimacy um, deterrence were no longer in, were, were not, didn't play a role because of the brute fact of legal, um, of pandemic legislation and, and lockdown. So if that's true, that legitimacy um, it will, be, will be an issue over the next month or few months, then um, we, we would say that it's important to, to, to maintain legitimacy through procedurally flat, f uh, fair light touch policing. So that's, that's me, I'll, I'll um, leave it there and pass you back to Ben.